I am not a paleontologist. I am a hobbyist. And uh, this started in 1999 when I received a, a newsletter from the Florida Museum advertising a paleontology dig in northwestern Nebraska, of all places. And I uh, thought, hey, this is a good lark. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and my late husband, Arthur, and I flew up to Minneapolis, rented a car, and started driving. It was quite an adventure. But can, can I have my, uh, oh, so anyway, I'm not a paleontologist. Um, my background is in economics, and uh, I always wanted to be a scientist. <laughs> and, and I discovered as a volunteer, I could be a scientist. So without further ado, Okay, so do I have a control? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. What is paleontology? A lot of people confuse it with archaeology, which is the study of the cultural remains of human civilizations. It is not paleoanthropology. Paleontology addresses the evolution of life and seeks to organize uh, all of this galaxy of information through a science known as cladistics. It interacts with several other sciences, including oceanography, sedimentology, geochemistry, tectonics, paleoclimatology, zoology, botany, marine biology, microbiology, genetics, and uses satellite imagery and ground-penetrating radar in its search for fossil-rich locations. But fossils themselves are the basic information source of paleontology. Fossils are defined as remains or traces of organisms that died more than 10 years ago. And through mineralization of bones and teeth, they survive over millions of years in embedded in rock, sediment, sedimentary rock. Fossils may be not only mineralized bones and teeth, but also tracks, boring holes, compressed impressions of plants and soft body life forms, inclusions like insects in amber, coprolites, which are fossilized feces. Believe it or not, they find fossilized feces from dinosaurs from hundreds of millions of years ago. Gastroliths, which are pe pebbles in the guts of, or gizzards of dinosaurs, just as wild birds will eat pebbles, will take in pebbles in order to help them digest. Each fossil type depends on just the right conditions for preservation at the time the life form dies, dies and it's entrapped in mud, tar, amber, volcanic ash, or the track is made in mud or volcanic ash. So fossil hunting isn't random. Fo <clears throat> Paleontologists have to identify depositional Environments like lakes, estuaries, shallow continental shelves, and ocean bottoms that form sedimentary rock in which fossils are usually found. For example, the early Eocene, Green River Formation in southwestern Wyoming, has a lot of fish from 30 million years ago. And it's a very popular area. There's a, both a national monument there and also a private land space where the owners are selling the opportunity to people like me to come and, and uh, dig up those fossils. There's also the late Eocene fluorescent information west of Colorado Springs, the La Brea tar pits, tar pits in Louis, um, LA, Los Angeles. Both of those sites were created by volcanic ash falling into a lake and preserving whatever was over and within the water. So they all, the um, fossil 
hunters, paleontologists, also uh, look for optimal conditions, such as where an organism would be rapidly buried in sediments where there's little or no oxygen, no, no bacteria or fungi, and in cool, still, mineral-rich water. So that would be like a continental shelf. The gaps created by the slow dissolution of tissue are filled with minerals such as calcium carbonate, iron carbonate, silicates, calcium phosphate, gradually taking the shape of the original organism, and compressions are the most common uh, fossil form, especially of plants, as the original organism is left behind as an imprint as it is slowly compressed between sediment layers. Walking, looking, and seeing is an important element of fossil hunting. And I've been there and done that. And you can get pretty discouraged. And then all of a sudden, one day, there it is. And wham, there's a whole, a whole opportunity to dig up fossils in a quarry. This, for example, is a compression fossil from the Burgess Shale, about 520 million, which formed 20, 520 million years ago. That is a trilobite. Uh, but look closely at the actual compression fossil. It's only one and a half inches long. And it's not, it's not the actual mineralized shell. It's just an impression of the animal that was uh, caught in an undersea landslide, mudslide. These trilobites are divided into, are part of the arthropod, arthropod group, and they uh, include insects, myropods, or centipedes, arachnids, spiders, mites, and scorpions, crustaceans, including the woodlouse, shrimp, and crabs. And I, they, the uh, trilobites in particular lived for 300 million years. They were a very successful uh, group that survived numerous minor extinctions. And I would swear to you, they still live in, in the form of cockroaches. Here's an example of mineralized bone from the original. This is a small pterosaur from the late Jurassic found in Germany um, in the late 1800s. Uh, and I have on the table over here a reproduction of that animal. Uh, pterosaurs were flying reptiles with some of which had a 40-foot 40, 40 wingspan. This one was only three. That's an artist's uh, representation of that pterosaur. And here is an example of an impression fossil. It's a birch leaf, and it looks like what we would see on a birch now, a modern tree. Uh, and this came, again, from the Eocene of eastern Washington state. Here's a fossil trackway. There, and this is in northwestern Nebraska. And here is one of the museum staff who was on a trip that I took with the museum to dig fossils. Um, by the way, the material that you have uh, printed front and back that was given you when you first walked in is something that I put together for myself 20 years ago when I was taking paleontology and geology courses, I couldn't keep it all straight. So I just created this table, and it's for you uh, to hopefully understand what I'm referring to when I say the Eocene. The Eocene is a period of, during the mammal uh, period, era, male, uh, called, referred to as the Cenozoic, and it, the e Eocene was, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Why don't I check my sheet sheet here? Um, yeah, 
56 to 34 million years ago. So we don't know what animal that was. Probably somebody has an idea, but certainly not, not I. So fossil preparation can be high tech. And if you go over to the museum while the fantastic fossils exhibit is on until uh, December 31st, you will see one of the volunteers or uh, lab staff, laboratory staff from the vertebrate lab working with it. Uh, I've done that uh, here and also at John Day Fossil Beds National Monument in Central Oregon. And it, I mean, you're handling very high pressure air uh, drills, for example, uh, something you really have to be careful with and you wear a mask because of all the dust. Uh, but it's fascinating work. It's like being a dentist and you can use a dental pick uh, for some of the work. Here are field tools. And that's my rock hammer, two varieties of chisels, a dental pig, a paintbrush, and I forgot to use the, uh, forgot to put in the uh, screwdriver, which is uh, <laughs> something one can use. Um, so here is the uh, trip that I made with uh, Florida Museum staff. I think that's me right here. That's my late husband, Arthur, and uh, two of the paleontologists on staff. And uh, this is northwestern Nebraska in June. It was comfortable, uh, climatologically speaking. But this area, uh, including up into South Dakota, was a rainforest 30 million years ago. Um, and these are all river sediments and lake sediments that you see here. Um, so the life that existed there was far different than what we see now. In any event, I was looking and seeing, as Dr. McFadden put it, and uh, feeling rather discouraged the, the, the uh, late afternoon of the last day of, our, of my first trip out there. And I was uh, just walking through this little narrow area between these two hillocks, and I saw something sticking out of the side of the hill here. And I thought, oh, that could be a fossil. And I dug around it with my screwdriver, and I realized that's exactly what it was. But I didn't have a heavy enough tool to deal with that. So I went looking for Arthur, who had a rock hammer, and he came and looked at it. He said, yeah, I think you're right. So I went running off to find these paleontologists. And this became the subject. This turned out to be a quarry of bones of a certain animal. And I have that animal's a cast, that is a reproduction, of that animal's molar on the table up here with my uh, exhibit. So the next two trips, the next two summers, we were out here excavating this hill and this hill looking for more remains. And we found ribs, uh, limb bones, a lower jaw. This is uh, like we're, uh, this is the next summer that we're out here. We're getting in there. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, Dr. McFadden. Oops. Sorry. Dr. McFadden, and this is the uh, one of the paleontologists and uh, another couple who were along. They, in fact, were the benefactors of the museum who, who arranged this trip. And this is uh, Steve Hutchins. And this is the son of the benefactors. And here we have one of the fossils in a, in a plaster of Paris cast. And it's so heavy because it has all the surrounding rock that the fossil's embedded in, plus this protective cast. So off it goes. And here it is in the lab. And you can just see the outlines of this jaw here. And that is one of the objects that uh, this molar 
of, of this brontothere um, that, that was contained in that hill. And this is an, uh, a reproduction or an artist's impression of what that animal would have looked like uh, 25 million years ago. It was the size of a small elephant. So this galaxy, this huge amount of information that paleontologists collect is organized through the, the uh, systematics of cladistics and demonstrated in cladograms. And this is a cladogram of angiosperms, i.e. flowering plants. Uh, but I'm not gonna go there. In fact, I never went there. <laughs> Here's a more simple explanation, a cladogram of mammalian development. Well. As you will learn from Dr. John Block, I hope, later uh, in this program, um, mammals, ancient ancestors, in the early period before dinosaurs evolved, in the early Triassic, were synapsids, a type of reptile that's considered pre-mammalian. Okay, so from them, and they were, they were almost completely extinguished at the, the, the extinction event at the end of the Triassic. The Jurassic is the age of dinosaurs and also the Cretaceous. Cretaceous. Um, so you can see here are the placental mammals. These are marsupials here. So they branched off very early, just even during the age of dinosaurs, the marsupials branched off and the placentals, that is, mammals who not only give milk to their young, but they also have wombs, uteruses. So here's our place right here, primates. And Dr. Block will be talking about the evolution of primates specifically, but you'll be glad to know that we are more closely related to, say, flying squirrels than we are to tigers and other carnivores or even horses, cows, elephants, and dolphins. Here's a, a yet more simple uh, tree of life, and it demonstrates that we vertebrates, that we're more, we're more closely related to, to stingrays and starfish than we are to shrimp and spiders. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and here's another even uh, larger scale that shows our relationship to bacteria, to another very primitive form of life called archaea, and, and then uh, things like protozoa, plants, fungi, slime molds, and here are animals. Uh, as we know them, mammals, uh, crocodiles, and so forth. So, and the difference is that bacteria uh, have no cell nucleus, which is characteristic of all these. We have cell nuclei. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so this is a... a, a, a something I found online that uh, shows the, the very beginnings of the planet being created back here in 4.5 or 4.6 billion years ago, uh, and uh, the development of very primitive single-celled, uh, no nucleus, uh, uh, you can't even really call them animals. Uh, then in the Proterozoic, two and a half to five and a half million years ago, we have bacteria, algae, jellyfish, and, and uh, in addition, something called ediacaran life uh, that this chart does not include. Here's the Cambrian, which is the beginning of multicellular life, the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, Permian, which is a major extinction event here at the end of the Permian when 90% of all ocean and plant life was extinguished. But it always comes back, doesn't it? And so there's hope for the long-term future, even now as humans are putting 
our biosphere at risk. So Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, the age of the dinosaurs, and then the age of mammals. So you can see we, we mammals have not been around all that long. We just like, if in fact we started back here in the Jurassic, uh, we've only been here for 200 million years compared with all of life. So what about this early atmosphere? Uh, how did we get oxygen? Well, the early atmosphere was carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, hydrogen, sulfide. Well, plant and animal life as we know it could not live like that. Uh, but, but oxygen was created over hundreds of millions of years by single-celled cyanobacteria, which is algae, in the oceans. They exhaled oxygen as plants do now. Well, it took hundreds of millions of years. Um, because there was a lot of iron in the ocean and the iron took up that oxygen until all of that dissolved iron was gone. And then we had more oxygen available in the ocean for more complex life to develop over, again, hundreds of millions or billions of years. A contributing factor is the fact that we have plate tectonics on this planet. That is, because of our hot, semi-molten rock between the center of the Earth, the iron nickel core and the uh, lithosphere as we know it, which is only 60 miles deep on average. Uh, there's this slow motion oatmeal boil going on, and that results in the plates, the continents being moved around. So you can see this mid-ocean ridge. This is where the hot mantle rock is coming up and forcing seafloor spreading. And that's why things are moving around. There's also things like subduction, where this creates new ocean floor, which then is pushed towards a continent and it is uh, subducted. That is, as you can see here, beneath the continent. Whoops. Sorry. Beneath the continent forms a volcanic arc like the Philippines and Japan and then goes down underneath the continent. And the pressure means that there are mountains being built. That's how mountains are built. Uh, we have the Cascades, for example, which are themselves volcanoes. And we also have hotspots, which is the Hawaiian chain, for example. That's a, where the ocean plate is going over a hotspot where there's an, uh, an individual a uh, plume coming up from the mantle. And also Iceland is an example of that. So these days and during the present time and for the last mm, 180 million years, we've had these, the, the Atlantic Ocean Ridge spreading, pushing Africa and Europe and the American continents away from each other and towards Asia, except you can see that it's not, it's going really more like west-southwest. And so that, that shear zone here is why California uh, is pulling away. And we have the rift zone in the Great Basin, west of the Rockies, where uh, the ground is lowering and it's hot and like in a hundred million years, this whole area will be gone. So we've periodically, the Earth has had these uh, supercontinents. And this is the first one from 900 million years ago, which has been named Rodinia. Uh, presumably, this is the equator. 
So Australia was north of the equator. Uh, north, what was North America was south of the equator. And up against the Amazon, the Baltic, West Africa down here, uh, the Congo, India, I mean, it, it really moves. This is an, ex an example of current uh, cyanobacteria called stromatolites. Uh, that these are the plants, believe it or not, that were exhaling oxygen. Why do they look this way? Because these colonies of bacteria uh, excreted um, mucus, shall we say, which entrapped the sand of the ocean and it formed these um, things. That, and, but they still exist. This is in northwestern, uh, northwestern Australia and they're called stromatolites. But primarily they were around in the Proterozoic two and a half to a billion years ago. Here is a, an example of what it looks like when it's sliced vertically. And uh, they make very interesting architectural features on buildings. Uh, this, this is a, a photo I took of a stromatolite in Glacier National Park. And here we're looking down. Uh, on, on the uh, natural uh, eroding stromatolite. So how do we know about the, or the uh, iron uptake of the early oxygen in the atmosphere? Well, these banded iron formations. Uh, this shows, this is a, a, a wide bladed chisel it, to give you a sense of the scale, but these red, this is like, ancient rusted iron in a, that's been transformed into rock. And the blue-green levels here are an example of the form of iron oxide that cr is created in a low oxygen environment. So here we are in the late Proterozoic when Ediacaran life developed. Well, Ediacara is an area of northwestern Australia where there's all kinds of early fossils exposed, very ancient rock and ancient fossils. But this, these life forms have now been felt and have now been found in locations like southeastern Newfoundland, Russia, and China. So it was not limited to small space in northern Australia. But 65. 650 million years ago, look where the continents are now. Antarctica is across the, the uh, equator. India is up against Antarctica, Australia, South China, and here's North America down here near the South Pole, Alaska. This is an example of what paleontologists have, have uh, learned about from the fossils, from life in the Ediacaran. And these look like plants, but they're thought to actually be animals. What's the difference? Plants take their energy from the sun or from um, surrounding chemicals, whereas animals eat plants and other animals. Here's uh, an actual compression fossil from Newfoundland of an Ediacaran life form. <clears throat> I haven't been there yet, but next summer. Late Cambrian, 514 million years ago. Here is North America, moving north. Siberia, Kazakhstan, Baltica, and then Gondwana and South America all squished here together. But here's a little bit of New England and Nova Scotia that's stuck on South America. My, how things change. Here's an example, an artist's impression of life in the Cambrian Sea, uh, and specifically the Burgess Shale impression fossils from 530 million years ago. The Burgess Shale was discovered by the secretary of the Smithsonian in about 1910. Uh, 
Mr. Walcott and his family liked to go on uh, walking and seeing trips uh, in the Canadian Rockies. And amazingly enough, this is what he found. Well, oh, well, he didn't find me, but uh, yeah, that was one of my life's ambitions to get up to the Burgess Shale. And one is allowed to do that only with uh, a guided tour. They don't want anybody coming up there and taking the fossils because it's still being researched. But back to this, let me tell you about some of the, uh, these animals. Okay, the big one is Anomalocaris. It was about a foot and a half long, and it's thought to have been the top predator. This is the mouth, and it's a ring of teeth, and it has two uh, appendages here for grasping, and it has in its clutches what appears to possibly be a trilobite and the fins for moving. And you see four different types of trilobites here. Already, they were evolving into different species. This is called a preopolid worm, uh, a predator. Um, let's see, I haven't got them all. This is a hallucinogenia. This is a wewaxia. I mean, <laughs> uh, but the most important one, as far as we're concerned, because we are vertebrates, we have backbones, is this called a pacaya. It looks like a worm, but it's the only animal that demonstrates that it has a, a, a notochord, i.e. Uh, a nerve running down one the back like this, which is seen as a predecessor of vertebrates. So this is um, uh, a somewhat later developed, I, I took this picture in Newfoundland, a uh, somewhat later developed trilobite, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a species that grew as much as 18 inches long. So anyway, there, here's me at the uh, Burgess Shale Quarry. Uh, it was like a four hour hike. And um, the, uh, I was in my early 60s then, and the leaders told me they thought I was the oldest person to make that hike. By the time I got down to the bottom, my legs had turned to jelly, and I could barely walk to the car. Fortunately, Arthur was there waiting for me, and uh, I didn't have to drive. <laughs> but the, the view from the Burgess Shale Quarry it is absolutely fantastic. That's Emerald Lake. There's a little resort right here. Uh, fireweed. I was just uh, it, for the views alone. It was it was just so rewarding. So, 250 million years later, uh, the continents have moved again. Kondwana, we have a supercontinent, and we're a, about to experience the Great Permian extinction. Well, there was no no uh, asteroid as there was for the extinction of the, of the uh, dinosaurs. Rather, what happened was that there was a big volcanic uh, event happening in northern Siberia that took place over millions of years. But the bad part about it was that there was nearby coal-bearing coal, uh, strata and peat. And that burning coal and peat put all this gases into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, very high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the oceans, which are an uptake for carbon dioxide, but it becomes super saturated and very acidic. And so that's literally extinguished 90% of, of all life on the planet. 255 million years ago. But life is very resilient, and it comes back. So here's an example of this synapsid mammal-like reptile that I referred to that was actually the dominant species, or dominant, not species, but dominant um, 
uh, I don't have the right term, life form during the first period of the age of dinosaurs. But they were extinguished, and these are thought to have been ancient ancestors, prototypes of a reptilian mammal that evolved into what we know today. Here's another one. I have a book on my show and tell table here about the evolution of mammals. That, and these photographs are from that book. This is a landscape in the late Triassic, the environment that those animals would have lived in. And there are very few familiar trees or bushes. This is a monkey pod tree, which you can see, uh, I think, in Africa. Here's a, a, a tree fern over here. These plants here are horsetails, which we still have uh, in cool, wet environments like in the mountains, but they're only about 18 inches tall. These were the size of trees down here. Uh, kunti, we see uh, in Florida, we have a native kunti. It also is native to uh, Africa and also yucca. So we will have a paleontologist who is the next speaker, and he won't be talking about this. He'll be talking about more modern, more modern uh, plants. So uh, Pangaea, the supercontinent Pangaea, broke up about a hundred, about really the the northern part of it broke up about two, started about 180 million years ago, and then a little bit later, or not a little bit, like 50 million years later. Uh, South America broke off of Africa. And we, it becomes more recognizable. But I want you to pay attention to what's happening to India down here. You see Madagascar broke off of India. And India, apparently there was a very rapid, rapid uh, breakup going, up, going on down here. Also, also at this time, Australia broke off of Antarctica about 60 million years ago, and India, India very quickly went up against China, uh, or what became China, forming the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, which is on average 15,000 feet high. So this is an, ex uh, an example from online of life in the Cretaceous, and we will have a speaker talking about that, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Since we don't have dinosaurs in Florida, we don't have a dinosaur specialist at UF, and we don't have dinosaur fossils at our museum. So here's the great mass extinction event that we've all heard about, where a 6.2-mile diameter asteroid impacted what is now the Yucatan um, at 12 miles per second. 75% of all land, plants, and animals were extinct by that event. And this is where it is, the Yucatan Peninsula there. So it's 120 miles. The impact crater is 120 miles in diameter and 12 miles deep. It was discovered by a couple of uh, petroleum geologists. The global effects of that impact a scalding blast of dust and ash and steam over a 360 degree direction impacted North America and South America, which suffered the greatest extinction. But also because globally, forest fires were ignited, mega tsunamis to possibly 4,800 feet high, reaching all the way to North Dakota. They found evidence now in the Dakotas of this tsunami impacting there. It's so exciting, it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> uh, so there was an instantaneous extinction of life across North America and Northern South America. The atmospheric dust and soot caused darkness and cold for as long as 10 years, extinguishing plant life globally. But life comes back. Around the same time, and there's some uh, controversy over whether the impact caused this in India or whether this had been going on in India for uh, a previous 5 million years, which 
is one argument I've heard, um, are, to, are the formation of the Deccan traps in West Central India. It's 500,000 square miles of lava that's two miles thick. So there's this another uh, a, a factor involved in the, dis, the extinction of life was the gases and the other effects from this massive eruption that went on for potentially 5 million years, or maybe only 30,000 years. So, of course, we have to think about the future. Uh, this is a recent uh, result of a supercomputer cal calculation at Curtin University in Australia, uh, where, given the present uh, directions, the present spreading forces uh, for our continents, what this is going to look like 280 billion years from now. So here's Africa up against Europe, which it is moving. I mean, that's why we've got volcanoes in, in uh, Italy and, um, you know, uh, because Africa is moving up against Europe. Um, we've got India, Southeast Asia, the Antarctic, and South, South America are together. Here's Australia in between North America and Southeast Asia. So we could have another supercontinent in about 200, 280 million years. And looking again at how continents are moving now, that kind of makes sense. So I'm trying to give you context for the lecturers who will come next. Uh, each one of them wanted to speak to their own specialties. And I was concerned that um, the audience would be lost without a certain level of context. Uh, and here it is. Uh, the bulletin came out before uh, Dr. Blocks, uh, he's the curator of vertebrate paleontology at the museum, um, before his uh, secretary was able to rearrange his schedule so that he can give us a lecture, but we've got uh, Plants on the Move from Dr. Manchester next week, uh, Dr. Kowalowski, uh, who's going to talk about invertebrate paleontology, that is uh, the paleontology of animals that have no backbones. Uh, Dr. Page uh, will talk about the evolution of fish coming out of water and, and the evidence, the modern evidence for that. Um, uh, Dr. Marshall, the Mesozoic wor world, the landscapes, ecosystems, and great change during the age of dinosaurs. And then Dr. Block will join us, uh, pushing Dr. Holbert back to the final uh, lecture on the history of mammals in Florida. And so thank you very much for attending. And um, perhaps I can answer some questions if you have any. I'll give it a try. But as I said, I'm not a paleontologist. I've, I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I used to live at Okamak. I uh, was uh, an early member of the Science and Technology Committee of ILR. In fact, I was the first, I was the first uh, chair of the Science and Technology Committee. I, I had joined the group um, not knowing really what, I mean, I knew what the committee was going to do, but it was being reorganized because my dear friend, and now I'm having a senior moment, Walter Califf, uh, was going to be the chair of the curriculum committee. And uh, he looked at me and said, you're going to chair the science and technology committee. And I said, I didn't sign on for that. He said, you will chair the science and technology committee. <laughs> and I did for five years. <laughs> Alice Gridley has her hand up. Yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, you have the enthusiasm for this that's comparable to being a UF fan. <laughs> and, and I'm just wondering how you got so interested in it. Well, uh, because um, 
I'm interested in a lot of things, and uh, I have a lifelong reading interest in archaeology because I lived in many different places as a child, and often those places had archaeological, very easily accessible archaeological features, such as the ancient cities of and uh in Sri Lanka, where my family lived for three years. Um, and so I wasn't really looking for a paleo dig. I was looking for an archaeology dig. But that fateful day that the newsletter arrived from <laughs> the Florida Museum advertising Pony Express uh, uh, paleontology dig in Nebraska, I thought, oh, this sounds like a great adventure. So I signed up. And then learning what I did, I started taking courses. Uh, at the university um, and realized at the age of 60 what I should have been doing all my life, and that is geology and paleontology. So that's, that's where it's at. That's, that's how come I became involved. And what, what a wonderful resource here at the university to be able to take free as a, as a retiree. I was able to take to just to audit courses. And the professors got to know me, and I was welcome because I was awake. <laughs> I asked questions. I volunteered. I became uh, um, a, the second driver for field trips. And I was able to watch those students misbehave, you know, get drunk and stuff like that. <laughs> so anyway. Your lecture has made me feel very young. And I'm wondering, <laughs> sitting here and wondering what's ahead for the human beings, how we're going to evolve or what we'll look like in 500 million years. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll have to ask Dr. Block about that. I'm, I'm sure he's given that a lot of thought because he's also going to be telling us about the impacts of climate change, I think. That's my impression anyway. Okay, we have a question here. Ellen Siegel, if you'll unmute, go ahead. Thank you. Phyllis, I've taken an earth science class at University of Miami, and you covered an entire semester so coherently. <laughs> I'm really very grateful to you for, for the clarity of, of your slides and the presentation. Um, next time, can you also have a pointer for those of us on Zoom? Because it was hard to, you know, it was hard to, or else describe what we're looking at on the slides. I was fascinated with the artist renditions of the different things. So thank, um, you. thank you, Ellen. So I haven't figured that one out yet. This is Julianne. So when we do, we'll figure out how to share the pointer on Zoom yeah. as well. <laughs> or else just describe, like upper left corner, look at the thing that's green or something like that, because it really was fascinating. Um, and Another good reason to come and join us in person. Yes, absolutely. Okay, another question here in the Oak Room. Yeah, the uh, first bacteria, how did they multiply if they had no nuclei? Um, you know, I didn't advertise myself as an <laughs> early life specialist, but uh, I have done some, re some quite some time ago reading on that. Um, Well, please give him the uh, give him the microphone. Come on, no, no, come on. Most things divide themselves. Yes, you know. right. Well, that's you. yeah. It, it, no, it, it was not sexual reproduction. That developed uh, actually fairly early. Okay. Any other questions else? on Zoom or here in okay. the Oak Room? Well, another wonderful presentation, a great start to this session. Thank you, Phyllis. All right, we'll see you next week, everyone.